Okay, welcome everybody uh, back to Facebook Live. Uh, this is actually our second event for my new book, The Best New True Crime Stories, Partners in Crime. And I'm joined today by Kathy Pickens, who's one of our wonderful contributors in the book. Hi, Kathy. Hey, how are you? Fine, how are you doing? This is, this is great fun. It's fun to talk about this. Oh, well, I, I'm glad I came up with this because this is like the 25th one, I think. I think we're number 25. <laughs> For the, for the fifth a silver book, anniversary I, yeah that's pretty good yeah i don't know how many of these if, if i keep doing these this series i'm what i'm going to be 100 200 <laughs> hey that's pretty good Start i don't know how you keep i don't i don't know how you keep all the balls up in the air that you're juggling but i'm I glad don't. you do I'm glad you <laughs> hey do. listen if you, if you followed the videos you'll know i don't always keep on the ball I, I i had a conversation with joe turner and he's telling me he's in this one book and i'm like no no you're not no it's the other book and he was like what <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the things happen so you know far out, you know that it's it's easy. I I'm glad you reminded me what we're talking about today. So good. I know. Well, I mean, this book just came out in in uh, February, um, and or actually January it was February in the UK, and um, and I just delivered the book that comes out after this, and I'm working on the one that comes out after yeah. the one I just delivered. <laughs> so it's like really hard keeping everyone straight. Like, wait a minute, that's not that person. Oh, They're not, not in this know. book. <laughs> Go away. Like, I mean, maybe I better check the table of contents to make sure you're <laughs> I didn't just slip in here on a way. You're the wrong person. Everybody yeah. go home. <laughs> well, well, you wrote a really um interesting story. And I'm I was really excited when you when you you gave me a couple of pitches. And and when I saw the one with a New Zealand story, I'm like, yeah, because I've been wanting someone to finally send me something that was, you know, a New Zealand based story. And and you were the one that you got it. Well, I, I don't know what what somebody from the southern United States knows about New Zealand, but this case has fascinated <laughs> me um, ever since I came across it. Um, and we were fortunate enough to go to New Zealand several years ago, but I'd already known about the story. But it was one of the things that made me look at Auckland um, with a slightly different, a slightly different eye. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the actual the title for the story is Love and Strychnine in New Zealand. And that kind of gives a little bit of a hint to people <laughs> <laughs> what one of the uh, things is going on in this particular story. You um, just can't make it up. You just can't no, you make can't. this up. This yeah. one is one of those stories where you sort of need to diagram and roadmap it because <laughs> it's just so bizarre. And, and these people, it's it's not like there's a lot of people involved. It's just no. the, the the case itself but um, it's so well, many years and so convoluted yeah. and you just don't expect what's going to happen no well set us up a little bit with with the time period uh the community what it was like um the specific locations got paint a picture a bit this is after world war ii as the world's putting itself back together and a fella um from england jimmy wilson decides that his uh fortunes might look better somewhere other than war-torn England. So he heads to New Zealand. And he's apparently a hard worker and he gets a job on a sheep farm outside Auckland. And the owner of the farm is Nora Harwood. She's inherited the farm from her father. And it's quite large and quite prosperous. And as these things are wont to happen, the two fell in love and got married. Well, now, Nora was a good bit older. It, the, the, the accounts aren't real clear about her age because, after all, women don't want to reveal such things um, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, but she was older than he was. And so they were married for 16 years. And people in the community, because this is a small farming community, kind of like the little country store down the road, and it's a little hike in Auckland. Uh, but folks who knew him knew that they'd kind of grown apart. And apparently word was even on the street that Nora wasn't letting him into her bed anymore. Um, so, you know, that, this has happened in their marriage. And he heads off to town as he does because he takes care of most of the business for the farm. He heads off to town one day and she typically spends the afternoon. She goes into the pantry, gets a, a bottle of her favorite lemonade drink off the shelf, opens it and sits in front of the TV and watches her afternoon shows. Um well, he comes home later that day and finds her dead on the floor uh, in front of her chair. Um, and that, you know, they, that, that looks like 
just maybe she had a heart attack or something. Well, um, it turned out that it wasn't a heart attack. Strychnine is, um, and I love the way you say it. My, it's a little, di- a little different. Here. We, um, but it's, uh, it is, uh, has its own unique sort of fingerprint that it leaves um, with very tense muscles, typically an arched back. They don't describe her as having that, but it's, you'll see old diagrams of it with a person with practically balancing on their head, the back of their head and their heels from these horrible convulsions. Um, And it's not a particularly nice way to die. It doesn't sound very, no. very nice. No. It, it, it's a popular poison, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, so, so, so far, we have Jimmy, and we have his wife, Nora, who uh, has died from uh, drinking some dodgy lemonade. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to put yeah. it mildly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, uh, as you mentioned in the story, when, when someone's spouse dies, the police immediately think of the number one person. Yeah. And, and we Jimmy. don't have, we do not have a cast of thousands here. We, we have yeah. Jimmy and Nora. Um, and, there, and there's there's a couple of other folks who come into the story, of course. But um, the thing here is that this poison is very common on sheep farms. It's a rat poison and it's very effective as a rat poison. Um, And it wasn't taken off the market um, until the 1960s later um, in over-the-counter medications. So um, as a rodenticide, it was um, much used um, on places like their sheep farms. So um, Jimmy said, well, maybe I accidentally filled the bottle with it and um it somehow got back on the shelf with her regular lemonades and it's an accident when if that really was the story we wouldn't be here would we <laughs> so, no no <laughs> well well obviously um the the police weren't quite buying jimmy's tale of the mistake in putting it in the lemonade bottle <laughs> Or was it? Or was it the neighbors who weren't quite buying the story? Um, it's it's Somebody not real wasn't. clear. Yeah, it's not real clear. But there's you know people that was like, no, no, no. You know they weren't getting along. And oh, by the way, about six months ago, he met a lovely little morsel named Freda, and they've been having an affair. And she's younger than he is, um, and more than willing. Uh, so uh, the neighbors were gossiping, and of course the police looked at it, but they did not prosecute. Jimmy, there was simply was not evidence that it was anything other than um, an accident. Well, obviously, being in this small community, then I mean, if, if we've all probably experienced this at some point in life where there's just awful, you know, lots of chatter and lots of talk and everyone's always in everyone's business. I can't imagine this was something you could kind of keep on the down low. No, no. And yet... Um, he marries, he marries Freda about six months later and, um, they continue to run the farm because Nora had left it to him in her will and they continue to be prosperous and, um, things go on and they're again married for about 15, 16 years. Um, and I don't want to give a lot of the, a lot of the story away, but I do think that for this case, Um, What is so interesting is um, this very handy choice of poison that everybody has access to in this farm community. Um, This woman with these very um, predictable habits about this drink that she gets off of this shelf in this order every day. um, And this, um, he seems rather you know, this sort of stalwart, handsome, large, hardworking farm man um, who's the center of this sort of, you know, gossip and what if and now a younger wife after having an older wife um, sort of thing. Well, how long did he wait till, um, was it a pretty short time period by the time It was time about, he... about six months. Yeah, they yeah. got married. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what stirred up a lot of the chitter chatter about it. Um, yeah. Th- and the case, to me, one of the fascinating things about this case is it highlights for me how, how hard it is sometimes for us to capture 
these sorts of stories. And I do think they're important. I, I'm sure this case could have happened somewhere else, but it's hard to imagine it happening somewhere other than this sheep farming area in in on the North Island of New Zealand. Um, the sheep they raised there were were not were not the merino wool sheep. These were the sheep that could survive in wet weather and produced really good meat to eat. So um, they um, this was this this was a small farming community. And a lot of places in the states and in the UK and you know Germany we have these we have all these communities that we know about at least from our grandparents and great grandparents. Um, but so this is a period of time that's rather unique. We, but we also know people. I mean, I have a, a friend here who is a, a farm D, a, a doctor of pharmacology, and her, she's fascinated with poison. She has a poison garden. She let, it's Lucy Zare. She's from Texas. Lots of people know her as a poison lady. She gives people <laughs> advice in writing their books on you know the the proper choice of poison for the situation. Um, but she talks about how you can go to these farmhouses in in the South and in the you know the West, Texas, Oklahoma, at uh, the estate auctions and just load up your trunk with deadly poisons if that's <laughs> if that's what you'd like to do. Um, and it's because it, it used to be an everyday thing, and we don't we don't realize it now. Um, strychnine was used. Um, in cosmetics, and it was very popular as a tummy calmer um, because it really what it would do is as parents, mothers would give it to their children if they got constipated. It's, oh. a, it's a very, very bitter, bitter um, plant, plant-based um, substance. And uh, so they would coat it, the little pills would be coated in chocolate. And so they would hand their children this little pill of poison <laughs> <laughs> make them go to the bathroom <laughs> so it's like you know i mean we're, we're not, you know uh, well arsenic was used as a as a facial it may and, and people would drop it in their eyes in liquid oh. form to make their eyes bright and beautiful um and so we have people who are dying especially in the 20s some of these cases that we talk about um, and probably it was just an overdose of everything from wallpaper to the dyes in their dresses to the cosmetics they were using. They just overloaded the system um, with poison. So we always hear about arsenic as, as a famous, and that comes into this case later. I won't spoil the surprise for everyone, but um, we hear about arsenic as a poison because it lasts. I mean, it's a heavy metal and it's still in your body hundreds of years after you've been buried. Wow. So that's easy to find. And that, I think that's why we hear so much about arsenic poisonings. I mean, we've had some in North Carolina fairly recently um, that have used arsenic poisoning. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I, I'm from South Carolina, but I live in North Carolina. I have for about 30 or 40 years now. And uh, North Carolina has more female serial poisoners as a state than anywhere else I've ever seen. And Is I'm that on the to, Tourist Authority website? I, 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 I do not know why the Tourist Bureau has not made better use of that. Um, yeah. Come to or, North Carolina. Or why wow, all the people are moving in here post-pandemic. <laughs> I you know, really need to rethink this. <laughs> so, but but I'm from South Carolina and we don't have that. So the question is, did we not use it? Did we not get caught? I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but arsenic is easier to get caught. Strychnine is actually a little more difficult unless you find this very unusual rictal grimace on their faces and the arched back. It's harder to find um, in the body because it's plant based and it eventually disappears. So, so this, easier this, to get away with, perhaps. Yes. And so that that they knew that this was it, um, but couldn't quite, you know, it mostly was because Jimmy said, well, I might have accidentally used a bottle and it might have accidentally got on the shelf. So he's he's kind of the one that um, put that out there for the authorities. Wow. And they didn't they didn't prosecute and they thought he was very straightforward about it and left it lie. 
Well, well, this Jimmy character, I mean, we talked a bit about him because he's he's quite an interesting guy. Um, he seems to have he, he seems to have no trouble attracting the ladies. I mean, no. was he some sexy, hot <laughs> character? You know, we don't really get a good description of him. <laughs> um, well, I, that's one of the things that's fascinating about, about this case, because, um, you know, you see my bibliographies. I am just rabid about digging out every little piece of information I can find. And this one, it was all secondary sources. It was, um, a, a, everybody credits um, John Dunning, who's a very well-known um, true crime writer, um, for capturing this case. And so I found out about it through a series of other true crime writers and their publications who gave him credit for this this case. But I could not lay my hands on original documents um, at all. So there's not a really good description of Jimmy. We're left with sort of the aftermath um, of this. He is described as being large and strong. Um, and he was a hard worker and he took care of things. And apparently... Um, his uh, amorous um, activities did not decline with age. So, because <laughs> so, I mean, we're they talking, didn't even have Viagra yeah, back then. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it wasn't that he was an old man, but I mean, he was uh, 32 <laughs> when he immigrated to New Zealand. And so now we're, now, you know, we're, you know, 15 and then later 30 years after that. So um, when he's, he's still got girlfriends that he's attracting. Um, in there so yeah and and Nora was um was older and spinsterish when he met her but apparently there was early on some affection but there was also this large and very prosperous farm yeah that's what I was going to ask you I mean uh, even though Jimmy you know pulled his weight around the farm supposedly um he, he's I get the impression he's he's a bit of an opportunist I mean yeah. um you know, now, obviously, there was some issues with the marriage. And then um, he's, his whole thing was, well, do I want to lose the farm and my nice, cushy setup yeah. here? Yeah. And, I, you know, that, you know, along with the fact that he already had a girlfriend, um, should they divorce, the farm is completely in Nora's name. And so, again, tongues will wag. Um, inquiring minds want to know. Um was was that was it in fact murder because he wanted shed of her but wanted to keep up the nice lifestyle that he had um her father had left it to her and she had never put him on the deeds for the property no so, community property laws there no, right? uh, no, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, no splitting that down the middle. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all is right. I mean, it was her farm, but um, obviously, uh, yeah, it, he definitely wanted to, to not have any big interruptions with his lifestyle because, yeah. I mean, if, if if he would not have been married to Nora, I mean, what would he would probably just be a hired hand? Just a hired right? hand. That really was his skill set. I mean, he didn't have any other particular skills. Um, and that was valuable at the time to be able to manage the business of the farm, which he did as well as doing the hard work, you know, but uh, which the accounts suggest that he did um, for this farm and help keep it prosperous. But it's not something that's easily transferable, you know, to the lifestyle that he maintained as Nora's husband. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, so without we're not going to go too far about giving away the surprise because <laughs> that's the whole story is just uh, how this thing twisted and turned so many times. But so he essentially married this uh, woman he was having an affair yeah. with six months after yeah. Nora. He married Freda and off. they and they stayed happily married um, for another 15, 16 years. Um, and then she dies. Yeah. And then the question marks again, um, you know, arise. And so some people were speculating, well, did this Freda person do something to Nora um, when she first died? Um, because after all, um, poison is a woman's weapon. Now, there's been a science writer recently who said that that's a myth. And she pointed out the fact that if you look at the poison statistics from in, in the U.S., that 60% of poisoning deaths are 
done by men and only 40% by women. However, yeah, however, men do 90% of the murders <laughs> and women only 10%. So if you look at the number of times that pe women kill and what their weapon of choice is, I still argue it's a woman's weapon. Okay? <laughs> so, because it's um, and, and the psychology of poisoning is very interesting. It tends to be done. The profile now is that people don't. These are people who don't like confrontation, um, who don't always, you know, if they, they don't, may see a situation they don't know how to solve. And this looks like an easy one because they can do it while they're not there. They're not present. Yes. Um, and they don't have to witness it. Except in the case of a couple of North Carolina murderers who were <laughs> one in particular spooning banana pudding into her dying husband's mouth um, oh. in the hospital. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people, people, people want to feel sorry for women who who end up, you know, charged with murder. I'm like, really? In that case, really? <laughs> um, but uh, it they, it tends to be it tends to be caregivers, um, either doctors and nurses or women with their families or children or somebody that's in their care, who end up being serial poisoners. So. Um, the, in this case, we so we have the strychnine death, then we end up having yet another death, and we're left with these questions, what the heck happened here? And the reason I think that um, Brian Mariner, a, a crime writer, a British crime writer, um, Colin Wilson, a very well-known crime anthologist, um, and John Dunning, and now me, um, are so fascinated with this case is that it takes twists that you can't, you can't, um, you couldn't put in a novel. I couldn't write this in a novel and have anybody do anything other than roll their eyes um, <laughs> about what happened and about my poor plotting because nobody would believe that. Um, and yet um, it was intensely, um, it made, it made intensely good sense to the people involved and the people around them we're doing what we all do, trying to solve the puzzle, trying to play detective, trying to understand what was happening in the lives of these people that we lived with and saw at the store down the street and went to church with and things like that. And and at the end of it, everybody was just going, this this can't possibly have happened this way. Um, but it did. Well, um, you know, that's the thing about writing fiction and, and uh, you know, some of these actual real crime cases, if, if you wrote them as a piece of fiction, again, like like you said, the rolling of the eyes, it just would be a hard sell to, yeah. to convince the reader that um, this is a believable plot line. But I, I'm sure you probably get this question from people. I certainly do. It's like, um, why why do you write about that stuff? Why do you read that why do you why are you so interested in that i have become more and more convinced that we're defined by our, our our area where we live our culture the people we know our time period are defined in part by the crimes that are committed um, by the people it, it, it's the aberrational edges of our society whatever that society may be but it's part of our definition um and i'm really aware recently of how much of that's disappearing. We think we have all this information because look at this, you and I get to talk to each other thousands of miles apart um, and to people we don't even um, know where they are. Um, but newspapers are drying up and the sort of deep research that went into those and photographs are harder to come by and court systems don't always keep all of the um, documents, um, especially once a case is settled or... Um, uh, it's beyond caring about. So we lose these bits of history if if it's not preserved in some way. And I do think it's interesting, not just from some morbid curiosity or voyeurism. A friend of mine calls it gore porn. Um, but um, <laughs> I said, no, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the psychology of these people and the puzzle of their lives and what made this happen then and could it happen somewhere else? And um, how did that affect 
the people in that community um, during that time. And I think for all these stories, that's that's what I find fascinating. Well, that's the thing that I keep in mind, too, doing these anthologies. And when I first started to do true crime, I did not want it to be, you know, use like gore porn or whatever mm. you want to call it. Um, it, it. The psychology, I mean, these are people, these are individuals, and, and you really want to try to get in figuring out what makes them tick, what makes them do these things, uh, rather mm. than just relaying a story some of some of some of which can be quite hardcore awful stories but it's that's not just the story isn't just the story it's people mm -hmm. in the story that that are the fascinating part and it's um it, I, the thing i like about your anthologies too is you really work to draw in a lot of different parts of the world because we do tend to get a little you know in my backyard kind of stuff, you know, what's yeah. close and comfortable. And I, in I like that too. But yeah. <laughs> I like that too. But um but it's um it's nice to sort of get a different view from South America or, you know, in this case New Zealand, um, that uh, gives us a different flavor and the time periods vary, um, which I think is interesting too, because this is very much a post post World War II kind of story. Yeah. Yeah, but what's what's also interesting is some of these stories may have taken place a long time ago, but there is, um, you know, it could have been yesterday in some instances. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. People yeah. don't change. The times change, the circumstances yeah. change, uh, the culture changes, but the people are still yeah. people. My, my grandpa used to say, people don't change, they just get more so. <laughs> so like, or they, I yeah. say they just get worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you are living a little closer to the edge than he probably did. <laughs> all, all this crime writing that you do. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I just flip the news on. That's enough to tell you. Oh, no, no, no. No, see, I, I will live happily in this world. I just keep the news off. I don't. <laughs> yeah. 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 Stay with fiction and true crime. It's <laughs> some sanity in life. <laughs> that's, that's a sad thing, isn't it? <laughs> it, it is. It is. Okay. Yeah. But. But it's, it's like you said, I don't want to live in the mind of a crazy person. I don't want to delve into some dark, twisted, you know, I, I just, I'm not interested in that. But I am infinitely interested in just normal people who get themselves into some of the awfulest fixes. And um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this, well, is, this, this is what it's always stuck with me. Yeah. yeah. The people in this story are just regular people. We're not talking about a serial killer that's no. honed and refined his or her skills for no. you know decades these are just regular people and a farm in a small community and you know mr joe miss miss joe average no. mr joe average you know which and, is the most horrific thing <laughs> and even jimmy couldn't see what was about to happen to him later on in the story and he was right there the whole time so yeah 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 well i mean as uh we can almost kind of say this was like a warped love triangle. It was. I mean, it was just, I mean, we th we know love triangles just rare. I, I don't know that they ever turn out good. Okay, for, <laughs> you don't hear about for, a lot of For somebody, stuff. it doesn't turn Someone's out good. Someone's getting shafted. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and in the worst case scenario, it ends up on Dateline or in one of Mitzi <laughs> Soretto's true crime books. But um <laughs> It's, it, you know, it's, it's something that we, we kind of know happens. It's when, and in this case, this weird twist in this, in this case, and, and you said before we went on air that you just about had to do a diagram to keep up with, uh, with all the people and there's not even many people involved, but you're like, could it really, you know, so to me, um, the cases that are too linear, that uh, you know go from here to there too quickly we just see it coming are, are not yeah. interesting it's the ones that give us an insight into this time or this place or this really unusual set of problem solving skills that some people bring to their lives um that i find but interesting jimmy had those he did <laughs> And then he got one up on it. So, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what you what you're saying about this is really what you would apply to fiction as well. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. it's it's not the linear. Well, we know what's going to happen because those just no. you know, it's it's the, it's that thing around the corner that you, takes you by surprise. I think that's the reader's satisfaction. Yeah, 
Yeah. And in this one, I think in any love triangle, um, it, there's a satisfaction to the moralists in us who sit back and say, well, didn't you just get what you bargained for <laughs> when something goes wrong? You know, it's kind of, well, you should have, you should have known better than that. Um, but in this case, it was like, um, things seem so normal and the marriages seem so steady um, through it that I think that's the really surprising part of the case that um, yeah. where we least expect it. And, well, um, exactly, exactly. It's just, it's just when, in my case, like when I, if something's going too well or it seems too normal, I'm always <laughs> looking over my shoulder. <laughs> Uh oh, uh oh. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. And, 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 and you know, in in plotting uh, fictions of any kind, but especially mystery fiction, you want those twists and turns, and you want to put your characters through something really. Um, you want them challenged. For you know, for me, I've been fascinated by some of the neuroscience research that's come out in the last few years about why story is so important to us that we are hardwired for story. If it's our test, I, I summarize it this way, it's our testing ground for things we'll encounter in real life. I mean, I'm not going to be chased by a saber-toothed tiger, but, and, and I'm probably not going to really need those physical um, hyperadrenaline responses to some something physically challenging to me but I still can exercise that part of my brain watching a horror movie or a serial killer, reading a serial killer slasher book or whatever it is. My brain still fires the same neurons that would fire if I were being chased by a saber tooth tiger. So we're hardwired for it. We always have been. And the same with the same with, you know, mushy romantic comedies. That's our testing ground for how does this feel? How do we respond? And our brain fires those responses, um, so, sort of like our little um, emotional adrenal cortex workout um, for life. And we get to do it in the comfort of our chair reading a book. <laughs> so um, like the safety of home. Hopefully. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and for me in true crime, I, I think that it's like people who read murder mysteries, um, we like the puzzle solving. We like to, you know, kind of figure out what's going to go on. But the demographic for um, the people who read and watch true crime are predominantly women, um, fast predominance of women. And people say, well, why? And I, I think it's because we want to learn what to look out for. We want to be able to protect ourselves and the people that we love. We want to know what, you know, what's what's the secret? Uh, what should I watch out for? Um, so we want to be in part be detective. In part, we want to be able to be safe and be a protector. And then I think there's this tiny little piece of all of us who wonders, am I capable of that in the right circumstances? Um, and you know, that's, that's, that's a hard look in the mirror sometimes, you know, <laughs> could I, and we say, oh no, no, but you know, we have to wonder, I think that's another part of our neural system workout, um, to resolve that for ourselves. Well, you know, you could probably ask that question of a lot of people who get prosecuted for really yeah. <laughs> hardcore crimes. I mean, maybe yeah. they, you know, five years before they would have never in a million never. years thought that they would have done something like that. Never. And then bang, there they are. And see, I, I work with several guys who were in prison and some for murder. And that's not what they set out to do in their lives. Usually it was young and dumb or drunk or something. and they're not it's not something they're ever going to do again you know it's not they're not they're not what we read about in books um they're what we could have accidentally become given the right circumstances and so mm. you're right they that's that was never in their career plan 
Yeah, and that's well, the probably Jimmy didn't yeah. think he would be. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think that was in Jimmy's career plan either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, to 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 be both suspect and victim eventually. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, maybe Jimmy should have kept his trousers zipped. You know, and we're, we're back to that. Yeah. <laughs> we're back to that. And these love triangles gone wrong. You know, maybe you got maybe maybe it wasn't what you expected, but you, but you probably got what you headed toward anyway. <laughs> so. Well, you know, I'm also thinking Jimmy's luck with the women may have been that there was not a lot of men around or eligible, supposed eligible well, men that might have, was married. Yeah. <laughs> Or there weren't enough. I don't know. But I mean, I'm I'm looking at Jimmy's case and I and I think about this a lot because I have friends that I'm like, oh, my goodness. He just grabbed a hold of a bunch of crazy there in, uh, in his in his later choices. And, um, you know, that happens. Yeah. Just keep those pants zipped up. Just keep them on those pants. <laughs> it's a good rule for a lot of people. <laughs> it's like, yeah. 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 Oh. Well, I mean, um, for for uh, would you say this is probably one of the most unique true crime cases you have ever encountered? Absolutely, absolutely, it is. It is. It's probably the top five for sure. Um, and 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 it may be it may be the most unusual when you consider all the circumstances, and the fact that it's hard to, it's not a commonly known case. Um, no, which is it's why not. I was so excited about writing about it because. Uh, it should be. It should well, that's be. what I was going to ask you is uh, how, what got you interested in, in, in this case? How in the world did you come across it in the first place? I'm a voracious reader. And um, so wherever we travel, whether it was New Zealand and Australia or whether it's to the UK or Germany or Canada or wherever it is, I'm in used bookstores buying up uh, true crime books. So um, and and this one just leapt out at me as just absolutely unbelievable and again these these guys that i've talked about um john dunning and brian mariner and colin wilson and others i you know i know how well they work on the materials that they um write about and um so they you know you want to you want to go to reliable sources for your stories um that that you read but um just, you know, certain cases. I mean, I've I've written some other things for you. I, you've given me this wonderful opportunity to to write about cases that just absolutely fascinate me. So so this is one of them. Yeah. You, I've got you in the pipeline on future books. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you'll, you'll and it's, be one of my regulars now. It, it's been great. It's been great fun um, to dig into these and have a longer story format to to tell them. Um, I, I do regional crime cases, but then I don't get to go to England or to New Zealand <laughs> to write about cases that fascinated me there. And I, I usually want to I want to dig into the context, the background. What's the technology, the forensic technology at the time? What's the culture like, um, the relationship between men and women? Um, you know, what prompted this? It's just, to, to me, it tells, it's history. It tells us of that time and place. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's what I look forward to with the stories is to offer all that information to really uh, get you. Because, I mean, you know, something from today's standpoint, and then you go back, you know, 50 years or 100 years, you have to realize circumstances were different, like you were saying about forensics and absolutely. all of that. And, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, there's a North Carolina case that I was writing about for something else. And just last month, 50 years almost to the day, the case was solved. Wow. And it was not forensics. It's the last surviving hitman in a medical facility in Georgia who's... Um, who so another one of his uh compatriots son remember we well, you know i remember my daddy's telling this story and so this is the last guy they go to your room yep we did it <laughs> like wow 50 years and it, it's a it's an odd case and so we're all used to you know there's now genetic genealogy and there's all this other stuff that miraculously solve cases and sometimes it's just people asking the right questions at the right time and a little flick of flicker of conscience or a deathbed um, confession yeah yeah he, he hadn't quite got there yet they're, they're not sure if it's dementia 
or he just still playing the cards close to the vest, but he won't tell who ordered the hit. Uh, but that's what it was. But oh yeah, we God. did it. But I, I don't know. I don't quite remember who wanted us to do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> crazy yeah you need to come to north and south carolina don't you think this sounds like a fun place <laughs> well i actually wasn't far from there i lived in uh, north georgia for okay. a while so oh, i would yeah. pop over the border well, to north see, carolina. okay some of these some of these the, the, the hitman is part of the dixie mafia in, in oh, nice. north georgia <laughs> north georgia's dixie mafia yeah yeah. I didn't know about them. I yeah. never just hear things about Meth Mountain and that sort oh, of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, that's another whole set. Of that. <laughs> no. Well, you know, the one cool thing was like, you know, uh, in my area where I was living, burglaries were really low because they assumed everyone was armed. <laughs> And they were. Yes. <laughs> Y'all get over my land. <laughs> you think that's a that's a hollow? <laughs> <laughs> a deterrent you didn't yeah. need to have a security uh, system every no. month to pay uh, no <laughs> everyone uh -uh. just assumed you're like concealed carry permit what <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh dear um, um so uh well again you know for those who are have tuned in uh kathy's story is love and strychnine in new zealand and it's an incredible story with lots of weird twists and turns um and uh i wanted to ask you we mentioned already you're 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 uh you're scheduled for a couple of future books of mine as well but uh what else are you working on any exciting projects oh god oh I'm, i am having a good time um i have <laughs> gone home to upstate south carolina for history press um this spring there'll be a book out in upstate south carolina and in that book is my first murderer who i met when i was three he used to come and chat with me at the post office. Oh, and the and my um my granny's uncles, who were revenue agents, and who were shot dead on a raid during a raid just outside the town where I grew up. So, um, not all the book is about my family, but <laughs> <laughs> I was at home. So, um, yeah, and um, just now finishing up a book on Western North Carolina. So I'm, I'm doing a series on true crime stories in the Carolinas for history press. And that's been a lot of fun. Um, I, I don't, I don't mean that maybe I shouldn't say it was fun. interesting, intriguing. Um, yeah, fun. So it's all not, it isn't all fried green maters. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh -uh, no, plenty of sweet tea, but yeah. <laughs> After <laughs> each murder, you have a sweet tea. It's a bit, it's, 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 it was when the moonshine gets sturdy, in which, you know, in the mountains, I mean, I grew up there and I, it was like riding this. I'm like, good heavens, people just walk down a trail and disappear. Yeah. And that's not something that happens anywhere else. I'm sorry. It just, you know, it just doesn't. So, um, so these are not all murder cases. Most of them are, but it is interesting. Like I said, I've been fascinated by how Eastern North Carolina, a crime can happen there that couldn't possibly happen in the mountains. And mountain cases couldn't possibly happen in Charlotte or Raleigh um, or New York City. They just couldn't. Um, and so that says a lot about the people and who grows up there and who, who, who went there to live. And, you know, I still haven't solved the mystery of the female serial poisoners, but <laughs> that sounds like a good one. I'll like, just, I'll just report on them. I, I can't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, I wanted to mention to uh, everyone also, um, Kathy's going to be uh, in an event in April um, called Women Writing True Crime. Uh, and we're also going to have Joan Renner on board. And uh, I did a Facebook Live with Joan last month. Uh, this is going to be uh, a free virtual event for the uh, Women's National Book Association, uh, the San Francisco chapter. Uh, and you do not have to be in San Francisco to, to participate. Uh, you don't have to be a member to participate. As I said, it's free. Um, and if anyone's interested in signing up, uh, it's it's just going to be a fun discussion with the three of us. Uh, it is uh, the website is WNBA-SFChapter.org. 
Uh, and you could find that information on my website under events. I've got it listed there. Uh, and uh, so that'll be fun. It's going to be me, Kathy, and Joan Renner. And uh, we'll be talking about women writing true crime. <laughs> Not 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 just not just limited to certain cases. So it's gonna be fun. No, 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 no. It'll <laughs> it'll be a, a bit more general. We won't yeah. be rehashing the books again. Although, well, of course, we'll be rehashing a little bit about the book. <laughs> yeah, that, that book. Yeah, <laughs> we can't go go out without doing that, right? But it will be fun to talk about it in in general. I mean, what 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 is this all about? And for people who might be interested themselves in writing, um, yes, true crime. Yes, this would be a good. A good session. Yeah, uh, that'll be on Friday, April 15th, uh, noon Pacific. Uh, I think it's noon. Yeah, noon Pacific, so 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. UK, uh, 9 p.m. Central Europe. We could just, uh, not regular, well, non-UK non, non Europe, since the UK is no longer in Europe, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. You can figure it out. <laughs> I think we should, we're going to have our, we're going to be on uh, Daylight Savings for the Northern Hemisphere, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Back to that again. <laughs> I don't know how you keep all that straight. <laughs> it just goes like this. <laughs> uh, oh well, it's been really great chatting with you um, I've again. I've been it. I've been on with Kathy Pickens, uh, her story from New Zealand in the best new true crime stories, Partners in Crime, out now. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, and we shall see you. I guess probably in another month, I'll dig someone else up from the book. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. Bye.